getting the mind to focus on the breath is not at all hard. The breath is right there, coming in, going out. All the time. Right here. The hard part is getting it to stay there. And this is where a lot of the skill in the meditation comes in. Learning how to get the mind to relate to the breath in a way that it's willing to stay with the breath. In the beginning, this means evaluating the breath, trying to figure out what way of breathing would feel good right now. Each breath, in and out. And what might feel good for this breath may not necessarily feel so good for the next breath, so you've got to be on top of it. Watch each breath as it comes in. Be sensitive of the body each time the breath comes in and goes out. You want to be careful not to squeeze the breath out as it goes out. For sometimes the mind has this cartoon idea of the breath that you've got to squeeze the energy in the body to get the breath to go out. Well, you don't. It'll go out on its own. And if you squeeze it, you're getting in the way of a sense of fullness, or rapture, or developing. So allow the breath to come in, and then if it's going to go out, let it go out on its own. You try to maintain a sense of ease, fullness in the breathing. And then from there you'd work on the different levels of breath in the body. There's the subtle breath that runs along the nerves, or runs along the blood vessels, that moves in unison with the in and out breath. And there's another level, which as soon as the in-breath starts, it has, goes right throughout the body very quickly. And then there's the still breath, which is a level of breath energy that's already there in the body. It requires the mind, though, to get really, really still in order to be able to tune into it. As John Lee once said, you have to know these levels of the breath in order to really know the breath. And as John Swat once said, when you're trying to get rid of ignorance, all you really need to do is know one thing really well, and that knowledge then spreads around to affect everything else in your awareness. So you want to get to know the breath really well. Look at it in terms of Four Noble Truths. Where is there stress in the breath? What's causing the stress? What can you do to put an end to it? Or at the very least to make the stress less and less and less blatant. That's part of the Buddha's answer to the question, well, what next in the meditation? We're used to things going in steps. How many of us have had experience with pushing things along a little bit? Once you know the map, you want to go to the end of the path as fast as possible, because after all, we're busy people. We've got a lot to do in our lives. But there's some things in life that you can't push. When you plant rice, it takes a certain number of months for the rice to grow and then yield its grains and for the grains to ripen. You may be able to accelerate the process a little bit by adding some fertilizer. But if you add too much fertilizer, the rice plants just burn out. If you go out and try to pull the plants up to make them taller, you uproot them, and that's it. So there are times when you have to realize that the same principle applies to the meditation. You can give as much effort as you can, but sometimes you find that the effort is misdirected. 
and you actually destroy the concentration by trying to push it too hard or getting impatient with it. Just stick with the breath, stick with the breath. And the state of concentration will grow on its own without your having to design it ahead of time or anticipate it. This is one way of learning the principle of cause and effect. You tend to the causes and the effects will come. It's once the mind gets still and the breath gets still, everything feels really good. You have to resist the tendency to give in to the thoughts that say, what next, what next? Because this state has to mature. It's like cheese. Some really fine types of cheese take years to mature. If you try to speed up the process, you ruin the cheese. You go down and you look at it, you can't see it maturing. In fact, if you go down and take the cheese out bring it up to see how much it's matured, it just simply won't mature. So you've got to trust that you stick with it. And as you stick with it, certain qualities that you need to develop are going to get developed. Patience is the main one. We're learning how to be good observers. Patience and equanimity are important parts of learning how to observe. So once the mind is still, you watch it. You're trying to be as alert as possible. This is a very delicate balance. And John Cumdee, one of the forest masters, compared it to being a hunter. The hunter has to balance two qualities of mind. One is stillness and the other is alertness. You go out and find your spot along the stream where you know the raccoon tends to come, or whatever the animal is you're trying to get. And then you have to sit there very still, so you don't scare off the raccoon. But at the same time, you have to be very alert, because you have no idea when the raccoon is coming. And you want to be able to detect its, the sound of its, its feet as it walks along the ground, or the rustling in the bushes. And so the ability to maintain that steady alertness is a difficult skill. Anthropologists, when they study tribes, tribal cultures, try to master all the different skills of all the different people in the culture so they have a hands-on sense of what it feels like to be a member of that culture. But it's very rare for an anthropologist to learn how to be a good hunter. Modern hunters, we just look into the Cabela catalog. Those poor deer don't have a chance. They have artificial scent. They have night scopes. They have all these things that allow the hunter to have no skills whatsoever, just a lot of gear. They can go out and they can bag their deer. Whereas traditional hunters need a lot of skill, and particularly the skill of concentration and mindfulness and alertness. It's all around awareness. That allows you to pick up on the, the snap of a twig, no matter what direction it comes from, no matter when it happens. That's the kind of all-around alertness, all-around awareness that you're trying to develop now. So you can't get impatient with it. You tend to it, you keep it going. And if you start noticing signs of impatience, remind yourself, this is a skill that someday is going to be your lifesaver. Right now you may not see any great need to have very still, very solid, steady alertness. When you start getting older, 
you're faced with serious illness. When death comes, this ability to stay still no matter what is going to save the life of the mind. And if just a little breath of impatience right now can knock it over, what's going to happen when there's severe pain? You're facing the end of your life. And all sorts of different thoughts come crowding into the mind. Regrets that you said this or did that, or regrets that you didn't say this or didn't do that. Whatever fear there may be around the illness, around your impending death, that's going to be more than just a little breath of impatience. It's going to be a storm wind, many storm winds. And you're going to need a stillness of mind that just cannot be blown over. The image they give in the text is of a stone pillar planted in the rock of a mountain. Sixteen spans long. Eight spans are buried underground. Eight spans are above ground. No matter which direction the wind blows, the pillar doesn't even shiver. That's the kind of concentration you want. So you're working on that kind of skill, which requires patience and equanimity, qualities which were necessary back in the old tribal cultures, especially the hunting and gathering cultures. But We've learned to dispense with them in the modern world, and as a result, we suffer. So we've got to fight that tendency that says, what next, what next? And see the question of what next as a disturbance that you've just got to shrug off. Don't take it all that seriously. Just learn to maintain this steady, all-around alertness. And as it matures, it turns into discernment. The Buddha, as a meditation teacher, did make a distinction between concentration and discernment, between insight and tranquility. But in actual practice, you find that the lines blur, because how can you have discernment unless the mind is still? If you keep running around, you got to chase off the deer. You can't see anything, you can't hear anything clearly, because you're making so much noise as you run, and your eyes have to gaze back and forth, back and forth, back and forth as you're running. Make sure you don't step on things, run into things. So what, what's next is right here, right here. And sometimes here, here it's said that the path is the goal. It turns out the original statement of that principle was that the development of the path was the realization of the goal. That makes a lot more sense. As you focus totally on developing the path, the goal appears right there where you're working, right there where you're focused. So it's not here that you're sitting, just biding your time with one eye in your breath and the other eye gazing down the path to see when the goal is going to appear. Focus all your attention on the breath, all your attention on the concentration, doing it as skillfully as possible. And that intention to be skillful <clears throat> is what turns the concentration from just plain old stillness into discernment. And John Lee makes this point. He says, when you practice mindfulness, you're working on mindfulness and alertness and ardency. And then as these qualities develop, the mindfulness turns into directed thought, the alertness turns into evaluation, the ardency turns into singleness of preoccupation. In other words, 
the mindfulness practice turns into jhana. And as you develop those qualities even further, they turn into knowledge and vision of release. So you don't have to look down the path to see what's coming. Look right where you are and be very steady in looking right where you are, and things will develop right here. <laughs>